are going. What's this? Oh. <laughs> that wasn't one of my slides. I see the wrong slide here, brother. I'm sorry. Apologize. <coughs> I thought you were making me do it. This one is right. This one says you're on your toes. All right. There we go. Um, I think that's last week. I mean, last time. No, it's not. Yeah, this one should say part two, right? Hold on. No, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. That's the last email you sent me. All right. So we're on the Beatitudes. Um, this will be part two. So before we actually get into it, we kind of just want to do a little recap. We went over what poor in spirit. Basically ridding myself of myself, acknowledging my sin, and understanding where I stand and that I need help, a savior. Then mourning over my sin, becoming kind-hearted, which is me. And once we do that and empty ourselves of all that junk, then we grow and we hunger and thirst for doing the right thing. This next one that we're going to touch base on, it's going to touch each one of us a little different. If we really look at this as it's broken down, and what I'm going to do is Throughout this, as we try to end the Beatitude series right here, um, we're going to look at these in different focuses. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. It started with the focus of being on ourselves, with the poor in spirit. Mourning over our sin, becoming meek and hunger thirsty. That's all related to what we are doing. But now the focus changes to how we treat others. This one today is going to be a little bit tricky, and it will affect each of us in a different way. So the thought is mercy begets mercy. Matthew 5, 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So if we show mercy in order to get mercy back. Is that right? That's not right. The thing is, is we seem to think that if we do something, we should get that back. We're taught that. But the thing is, the point is about, it's always pointing to us. If we do this, we should get it back. If we do this, but we forget that God did it first. He showed us mercy first. And if we can actually start looking at things that way, then maybe we can humble ourselves down from all that pride. If we do the previous Beatitudes, then we should be at a place where we can show mercy uh, naturally. Mercy is something that we all struggle with. And a lot of us kind of may not see it in that point, um, because a lot of us can probably show mercy pretty decently. But mercy says to show kindness, forgiveness, or to be helpful. You know how that? So basically saying to be nice, to let it go, and to be helpful. Inside the church doors, these things are easy to do. But what about outside the church? What about the person standing at the intersection asking for handouts? This is something that I ponder on a lot. This is something that I've talked to people a lot about, and everybody has different opinions on this. We have many excuses about these people. And I agree that we need to be wise about our blessings, but does that really always work? Is telling them no right? Is it being merciful? Do we pick and choose who to be merciful to? So the question is, how do we show mercy? And I can't answer that because I don't know. I'm coming to my own terms on things that I need to deal with on my own, and each one of you will come to your own terms on what you need to work on. And it's going to hit us all differently. 
My plan is to hopefully give you enough info by the end to figure out in your own heart what it is that you need to work on. Does Jesus always show mercy? Yes, but he does it in different ways. One is the rich young ruler. Jesus could have given him salvation, but instead he gave him a choice to see if it was actually in his heart to do the right thing. Jesus with the Pharisees. Jesus never really answered them truthfully, only with answers, well, he answers them with questions. He gives them a choice and challenges their thinking. So Jesus always showed mercy, but he did it with reaching into their hearts to see what they, if they could actually see deep within what they were thinking. Matthew 25, 34 through 46 says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you um, visit me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you at, uh, a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick, or in prison, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these least of these my brethren, you did it to me. So if we were to rewrite this, it would look more like this. To receive mercy, um, I don't have that one. To be content and sheltered by God's promises, a disposition of kindness, forgiveness, and helpfulness towards those who are suffering will receive the same by God. Luke 10, 25-37 says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. Likewise a Levite, who he... He arrived at the place, came and looked, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two genaries, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend... When I come again, I will repay you. So which of these do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he show, who showed mercy on him? And Jesus said, go and do likewise. The priest and the Levite can represent the church. They both knew better, but they refused to do it. A Samaritan, Samaritan and Jews never got along. They actually hated each other. But it broke the Samaritan's heart because it says he had compassion. And he went over and beyond for this Jew. So who is our neighbor? I don't have that one either. Basically, anyone who is in need. Anyone we pass by. Doesn't have to be people we know. Can be anybody that's in need or anybody that we pass by on a daily basis. No matter the color, the character, being merciful is being mindful. 
It means to no longer be judgmental, critical, or analytical. To receive mercy is not to get what you deserve. To receive pity instead of just commendation. commendation. Rather, you're, when you're guilty, mercy removes that misery you ought to receive. You're a blessing for those who extend it because you can bank on the fact that the time is coming when you'll need a m- mercy. This is the golden rule in action. Wherever you want others to do for you, do also to them. Matthew 7, 12. So pure, uh, the next one's going to be pure in heart. But before we get into that, I brought up the merciful because um, the biggest challenge is the people in the intersections paying out for money. I mean, we can look at them like they just want money for drugs or whatever it may be. But we don't know exactly what God's doing in their lives. We don't know exactly what their struggle is. We could be correct. Maybe they're using it for drugs. But where is it our point to judge them on that? It's kind of hard to give money over to somebody which you know is going to do that. So that's why I put in sometimes we kind of look at where we're using our blessings at. But isn't that being judgmental? So for me, that's a challenge for me because I fight with that. Do I give them money? Do I not? And some of you guys may question the same thing. Some of you guys may have different um, focuses on what you need to work on, on being merciful. But I just think that one was a prime example. Um, That one's one that I struggle with. Sometimes I give them money. Sometimes I'm like, I just don't feel right giving them money. I, I don't know. But merciful is a tough one to deal with. So pure in heart. A pure heart increases your vision. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So there's a difference between having a pure heart, I mean a clean heart, and a pure heart. All of us who have embraced the Lord have clean hearts. But a pure heart is one not distracted by the things of the world. Think of it this way. All soap is clean, but only one is 99.44% pure. And that's ivory soap. Ivory soap doesn't have deodorants, perfumes, additives, or colorings. Ivory is nothing but soap. Other soaps are clean, but they're not pure. The pure in heart shall see God. It's to bring us to a pure place in order to see God. Because we can see God now, and we don't have to wait. We can see in the work that he's doing in us and around people around us. We can see him in nature and all of his creation. We can see him in scripture and all his blessings and promises. And we can see him in our own church family. We cannot experience God's fullness unless we are pure. I didn't say we can't experience God, but his fullness. God is rebuilding and making us pure so that we can see him and what he's doing. And then maybe we'll come and join him. Blessed is anticipating God's presence. Spiritually mature, not because of your doing, but your doing because of your being. So, pure in heart, integrity, moral courage, godly character, holiness. To be spiritually mature... In living in anticipation of God's presence, one must exercise integrity, moral courage, and godly character to see God now and forever. Matthew 1 through 20 says, Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do you disciples transgress in the tradition of, our, of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he who uh, curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you may have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father and mother. 
Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines and commandments of men. When he had called a multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth defiles a man. Jesus was dealing with men's spirits. Spurgeon. Christ was dealing with men's spirits and their inner and spiritual nature. He did this more or less in all the Beatitudes. And this one strikes the very center of the target as he says, not blessed are the pure in language or the pure in action, much less blessed in the pure in ceremonies or in raiment or in food, but blessed are the pure in heart. So what do we get out of this? The gain is to see God. Freedom, peace, joy, contentment, clean, blameless, unstained from guilt. What do we lose? We lose, well, bondage, self-gratification, guilt, shame, and blindness. So consider what Jesus, the I Jesus stated. Those things which proceed from the mouth originate in the heart. Pureness of heart clears the path to see God. So we're going to do another recap. Poor in spirit, born over our sin, is a rebuilding process. Meekness, thirst, and hunger is a filling. That's when the Spirit starts to fill you. We cannot be meek on our own. Merciful and pure in heart is a reflection of Christ. And now we move on to peacemakers. So, thought on that, purposeful peace reflects the Father. Not exactly inner peace, but how we live our life. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Purposeful peace is intentionally doing right in the situation. Being a peacemaker is less about us and more about God. This does not describe those who live in peace, but those who actually bring about peace, overcoming evil and good. One way is we accomplish this is through spreading the gospel. Because God has entrusted us to the ministry of reconciliation. In evangelism, we make peace between man and God, whom they have rejected and offended. Spurgeon writes this. The verse which precedes it speaks of the blessedness of the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It is well that we should understand this. We are to be first pure, then peaceable. Our peaceableness is never to be compact with sin or in alliance with, with that which is evil. We must set our faces like flints against everything which is contrary to God and his holiness. That being in our souls a settled matter, we can go on to peaceableness towards men. Um... To be at peace is to be in harmony. To be a peacemaker is to be a mediator and resolve conflicts between estranged parties, whether individuals or groups. To make peace by defining the truth, addressing the sin, and constructing a bridge between those who are at odds with one another. Peacemaking can be a difficult work, but if we persevere in it, we will be called sons of God. Because we resemble our Father in heaven. He sent the Son of God to be our mediator, bridging the cap created by our sin and grant us peace to him. So, we're sons of God. What does it mean to be a son of God? We're inherited into the um, kingdom of heaven. We are adopted by our Father God. 
But our children are a, reflect, a reflection of us, pretty much naturally. But we have to work on being a reflection of our Father in heaven. It does not come naturally. What does come naturally? Sin. The total opposite. So this is something that we have to work on, reading our Bibles, understanding God and his ways, his promises, and molding ourselves and letting the Holy Spirit really work within us in order for us to be that reflection. The reward of peacemakers is that they are recognized as true children of God. They share his passion for peace and re reconciliation and breaking down the walls between people. Though the peacemaker may be ill-treated by man, he is blessed by God. He is blessed to be among the children of God. Um, we can kind of take two people that are arguing and kind of get in the middle and be a mediator and settle things. But it seems that when we do that and we're adding scripture and the truth to the matter and we're pointing out the blames, they don't like us that much anymore, right? This can be tough. Spurgeon wrote, and he sometimes put himself between the two when they are very angry and take the blows from both sides. For he knows that so Jesus did, who took the blows from his father and from us also. That so by suffering in our steed, peace might be made between God and man. So we'll go through another recap and a different focus. Poor in spirit is a cleansing. Mourning is repentance. Meekness, hunger, thirsting, and merciful, pure in heart are all parts of change, which are intentional change. Peacemaker is a maker and maintainer of peace. Striving to prevent contention, uh, contention and strife. Is everybody in the world happy? No. And there's a lot out there that God has set us on this earth to do for his will. John 16, 31, 33 says, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe, indeed, the hour is coming, has now come, that you will be scattered each uh, to his own and will leave me alone? And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world that you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. <clears throat> Reminds me of the verse in James. It says, during your tribulation and stuff, find joy. How is that possible? When you're under attack, the last thing you're thinking about is joy. Well, the next one's going to be a little difficult. So we're going to rewrite this one. To be spiritually calm and full of joy, one should strive to make and maintain peace by striving to prevent any contention or strife in order to replicate the Father's character as his children. And before we get to the rough one, <clears throat> we're going to break this down one more time. Number one, our attitude towards ourselves, poor in spirit. Number two, <clears throat> our attitude towards our sin, mourn, meek, hunger, and thirst. Number three is our attitude towards the Lord, merciful, pure in heart, and peacemakers. We need to rid ourselves of ourselves emptying all of our junk. We need to mourn over our sins and despise it. Seeing sin the way God sees it, also meekly submit to God, become kind-hearted. Then we hunger and thirst for doing right. We experience God's mercy when we trust in Christ and he gives us a clean heart and peace within. And we share the mercy with others, working on keeping our hearts pure and showing Jesus as we are peacemakers. Because God is the author of peace and Jesus is the prince of peace. This is who we serve and how we are to walk. Reflecting Christ brings persecution. 
Matthew 5, 10 said, Bless those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, maybe we can think that possessing the Beatitudes mentality that we spoke about, if we're aware of our own poverty, mourning over our sin, um, being meek, hunger and thirsting after righteousness, had a pure heart, showed mercy, we would be pretty much popular, right? It doesn't work that way. If the attitudes of meekness and mercy, poverty of spirit and righteousness or heart are being worked out in you, you will encounter persecution. You will have enemies and you will be slandered and misunderstood. In America, we're not really facing persecution. Our brothers and sisters overseas, they are. They're being put in jail, family taken, etc. They're even being killed for their faith. However, today, we're starting to see some of that in America. We're starting to see the persecution coming and creeping into America. When you choose to do right, you are persecuted. Oh, when you're doing right and are persecuted, that is when you are blessed. So when it happens, you gain heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of things, all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. So you're not being persecuted because of you. You're being persecuted because of him. Everyone hates Christians. Just the way it is. Muslims are actually being tolerated in this world. Jews are being tolerated to a point. Jews were heavily persecuted, but now in America, people are pretty much accepting that religion. But Christians, nobody wants to accept the Christians. Christians are the ones that push back on all the new ideas and evil that people want to change. It's the Christians. We reflect something that they cannot understand. Matthew 5, 12 says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So rejoice and be glad. How do we do that? When we can get our mindset that we are reflecting Christ, it's a little easier to do. Overseas, they're being persecuted, and they're still able to uh, rejoice. So we know it can be done. It's just not easy. Matthew 5, 10 through 12 says, Blessed, and this is through the Amplified Version, Blessed, comforted by inner peace and God's love, are those who are persecuted for doing that which is morally right. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, both now and forever. Blessed, morally courage, and spiritually alive with life, joy, and God's goodness, are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of your association with me. Be glad and exceedingly joyful, for your reward in heaven is great, absolutely inexhaustible. For in this same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Being persecuted for your belief means you have accomplished the Beatitudes. The character traits described in the Beatitudes are not valued by modern culture. If you're willing to be rejected by men to be accepted by God, then the kingdom of, your, uh, kingdom of heavens is yours. Because you claim the name of Christ and you reflect Christ. Don't suffer for the wrong things, but suffer for doing right. So now we're going to look at, see what Jesus says. Matthew 10, 16 through 31 says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Before I move on, I had to really dig that first part out. I had to really 
My son's pointing at the screen like I didn't change it. I don't have that one. That's why I didn't change it. <laughs> but that first part, um, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We'll touch base on that when I'm done. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in the synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak, for it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now, brother, will deliver you up, brother to death, and a father his child, and the children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in the city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant alone above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he is to be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Bezalbub, how much more Bezalbub, how much more will they call those of the household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill, kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both, soul and body and hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. So I'm going to go back to the sheep. Jesus referenced a couple of different things in this. Sheep, what are sheep? They're gentle, right? Gentle sheep. Wolves, what are wolves? They're pretty ravishing, right? Eat you up. Then he goes to wise serpents, serpent, serpents and harmless doves. What he's saying is don't go in with both barrels ready to blast. Don't be a, um, wise serp be a wise serpent and harmless doves means to go in sweet and kind. Sometimes we let our anger control how we uh, do things. Don't go in with both barrels ready to blast. Go in sweet and kind. No finger pointing. So Jesus taught these Beatitudes first on the mountain because before we can truly accept what comes next, we must know who we are in Christ. And the Beatitudes is a step process. We must rid ourselves of our junk, poor in spirit. We must mourn over our sin and see sin as God sees it. We must allow the Holy Spirit and God's word to work within us, creating us a kinder spirit. We must hunger and thirst for God's word and will and not the world's. We must acknowledge God's mercy and show others mercy. We must continue to allow God to create a pure heart in us by submitting to him. We must stop standing by and start stepping up as peacemakers. We must be prepared to face persecution. This is what sets us apart from the world. This is what reflects Christ, and this is what the world and evil hates. But our gains are what? To be comforted, obtain mercy, to be filled, to see God, to be called sons of God, and to own real estate in the kingdom of heaven. Did I do something wrong? We don't need that. So to be comforted, obtain mercy, be filled, to see God, be called sons of God, and to own real estate in the kingdom of heaven. What does that sound like? All parts of salvation, right? 
And as salvation is a free gift and it cannot be lost, we should strive to follow God's word and Jesus' teaching to receive the rewards that God has for us now. The Beatitudes are a very important look at it. Can we back up and run? Did I hit the wrong button? Is that what you're telling me? Are you sure? Yeah. I, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> the Beatitudes are a very important look at a Christian life, as well as a picture of someone repenting his sins and accepting Christ into his life. When we can get to the point where we see ourselves in a simple way and we acknowledge our sin and we know that we cannot do this life any longer and we give ourselves to Christ, poor in spirit. We're mourning over our sins because we've seen the way we lived life before and we repent and give it to God. I kind of lost my spot. We allow the spirit and God's word to work within us, creating us a kinder, sweeter spirit. We begin to hunger and thirst for God's word because we're noticing how it's changing us from within. We must acknowledge God's mercy and show others the same mercy. When we're all saved, we're gung-ho to go out and just spread the word and just we're rejoicing big time. What happened? That seemed to fade away a little bit. We have to keep re-kicking that in the gear. But if we just stay in the word of God, then that should automatically be a routine. We must, oh, I already read that one. We must continue to allow God to create a pure heart in us by submitting to him. See, we may be able to do the first couple, but then... Being at home with the scripture and being in the world, workplace, things like that, there's a division. And sometimes we drift. We must stop standing by and start stepping up as peacemakers. Most of us have Facebook. Most of us have seen a lot of different things. There's always videos out there about kids fighting on a bus at school all kind of crazy stuff, and nobody's stepping in. Nobody's helping out. Everybody's got their phones out recording, but nobody's doing anything. Something to think about. Would you jump in? I pretty much know you guys ain't going to record it, but would you just stand by or would you jump in? Would you try to break it up? Would you be a peacemaker? In today's world, it's scary. But that's something that we struggle with, and that's something that we need to think about. What would Jesus do? Hmm. We know what Jesus is doing, but are we able or brave enough to do it? I'm not saying you just jump into any fight. You may get yourself killed. But it's something that we need to think about. Is there situations that we stood behind that we could have jumped into? Maybe we don't have to jump into the middle of it. Maybe we can get involved by calling the police, making a stop, grabbing somebody, a teacher, something, anything. Maybe we can grab somebody else to jump into the middle of it. But these are things that um, the more I go over them, the more I start reflecting on, okay, I got a lot to work on. But when I really came down to different focuses on it, it's the Beatitudes. It's the steps that Jesus said to be a Christian and to be like me, you're going to go through. You can't be a peacemaker if you never rid of yourself of all your junk. They're in order for a reason. They're the being attitudes. This is how you should be. Cleanse yourself. Repent. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and reflect Christ. 
But when I really brought down and understood that everything that you were gaining from it, it was a picture of salvation. It was a picture of somebody coming, understanding where they were, laying it all down, repenting of it, accepting Christ as their Savior, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. One thing I'm not saying is that salvation is something that you have to work on. No. Salvation is free. And you can stop right there and you can be saved. But the Bible is telling us that we need to work on some things. It wants to change our mind from a carnal mind to a spiritual mind. The only way you can do that is by reading the Word. And when you do that, you start becoming a little bit more kinder and a little bit more sweeter. So the Beatitudes aren't things that you have to do. It's things that you should be doing. That's all I got for you guys this week.